together between going to Gomukh and Rishikesh and Uttarkashi and so on, I lived for three and a half years with Babaji. And during those three and a half years, I had passed through so many experiences, which I think it would have been impossible for me if uh, Babaji's presence was not there on this earth to guide me. There are a couple of things I have to say during that period. One is our visit to uh, Gomukh. One day we set out from Uttarkashi to Gangotri. <coughs> We lived, we stayed in Gangotri for a while uh, in a Kutir belonging to a Naga Sadhu. After two days, we started the climb to Gomuk via um, Chirbasa and Bojbasa. The first day, we stopped at Bojbasa, and there there was a tantric uh, yogi from Bengal who had set up his ashram. For travelers, there is no place there where they can stay or where they can eat in Bojbasa before that. His name was Lal Baba. And the ashram he set up was known as Lal Baba's ashram. It was all painted red. Because red color is very important for uh, these uh, tantra sadhus who practice tantra. So, we spent some time that night there. And the next morning, we went off to Gumuk. Uh, Gomuk, you must understand, is so high up. It's, I think, nearly 18,000 feet or so above sea level. Uh, and there, there, in those days, there was no accommodation available. Nowadays, you, you might be able to find some accommodation in um, Gomuk because the ITBP, the Border Security Police, Indo-Tibetan Border Police has a few places where you can stay. So from there, we just walked up to Gomuk, had a nice dip in the cold waters of Gomuk, which only in the first dip it is freezing, afterwards you will become all right. The secret is to keep a towel near you, take one dip, take a few quick dips and then come out and rub yourself dry before you freeze. So we had a uh, dip in the river and then we decided to walk to Tapawan. Now, Tapawan is a big glacier that still goes higher than Gomuk. So we walked on. It took us uh, about a day, almost a day, that we reached uh, uh, a place which is the highest point. Uh, you can see the Satopant from there. The Bhagirathi peak is visible quite before that. And then if you look on the other side, you see the beautiful Gangotri glacier, which stretches for miles and miles with no tree, nothing in sight except a vast sheet of ice. Now that itself, at your first look, if you look at the Gangotri glacier suddenly, something happens to your mind. It also becomes like a vast sheet of ice spread all over. And it is under this that the Ganga flows out through the Gomuk. But you have to be very careful when you walk on the glacier because some places the Tapavan glacier has holes, which has a very thin covering, so you shouldn't break the ice and go inside. Very often travelers find skeletons there of people who have gone and not come back because there is no place to stay there. And at the highest point of Tapavan, from Tapovan, you can actually have a glimpse of Kailash on the other side, the great Kailash mountain. So anyway, so from there, after spending some time in uh, Gomuk, I'm sorry, in uh, Tapovan, we came back because you can't halt there. There's no place. You'll freeze to death. I don't know about Babaji, but I would. So we came back. Now, in between Gomuk and Tapovan Glacier, the top of Tapovan, there are a few caves, generally not occupied by anybody. But sometimes there are people who come and stay there in summer. So when we came back, we went to one of these caves where one of Babaji's old associates, who he simply called as Dadaji, 
and he was from Bengal. He was staying in one of these caves. So we spent the night, we decided to spend the night. Dadaji said, why don't you stay for two, three days? This young man is very tired, Babaji. You cannot make him go up and down like this. So Babaji said, okay, fine, you stay here. So he made uh, food for us. Whenever he came and stayed there, he came with sack loads of provision. So after a long time, I ate some rice and put it to curry there. It's very difficult to cook dal in those heights because the air pressure is very low, but potatoes you can cook. Anyway, so, and one evening, Babaji told uh, this man whom used to mm -hmm. call Dadaji, Dada, why don't you initiate him into the Sri Vidya? So he said, but why should I initiate him into Sri Vidya? You are more advanced than me, you are senior to me, you should initiate him into No, 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 he said, I want you to initiate him into the Sri Vidya. So he agreed. So we lit a fire, sat down, and I got initiated into what is known as the Bala Mantra. Then it's called the Bala Tripura Sundari Mantra. Then the Panchadashakshari Mantra, which is a 15 lettered Sri Vidya Mantra. And the Sodashakshari, which is the 16 letter Sri Vidya Mantra. Now, when I say this, you will wonder what is this mysterious Sri Vidya Mantra. I have to explain this. Sri Vidya is called the Tantra Gayatri, just as the Vedic Gayatri is the mantra Om Bhuva Swa and so on. The Sri Vidya is the what is called the Tantra Gayatri. Now, in the practice of Sri Vidya, why is Sri Vidya practice? What is the advantage of Sri Vidya? Why do people do it? Now, for this we have to go into the understanding of what Tantra means. People have all kinds of wrong notions about Tantra. They think that Tantra has something to do with dead bodies or something in cremation grounds and so on. Some people do practice it there, but it actually has nothing to do with these matters. The problem is, Tantra is divided into two parts. One is called the Samaya Marga and the other is called the Vamachara. Vamachara, the left-handed path and the right-handed path, which is called Samaya Marga. Now, the Vamachara is usually for people of a certain category who cannot rise above their needs unless and until they are exposed to it for some period of time. But the idea is finally to rise above and not get stuck there. Now, Vamachara therefore advises people to use the pancha makaras, which includes liquor, uh, meat and so on, so that one, after experiencing it, gets rid of the craving for it. That is the intention. But usually what happens is one gets stuck to it. There is no, it's very difficult to come out of it, mainly because of the lack of a proper teacher who can guide one to get out of it. And it is Vamachara which is usually associated with sitting in cremation grounds and all these kind of things. Basically, it is meant to get the fear out of our minds. It has nothing to do with the ritual of any dead spirits or anything of that kind, which is all nonsense. Now, Samaya Marga, also in Vamachara, the Devi or Shakti, Parashakti means supreme energy. Now, you know that the whole world is pervaded by energy. There is nothing that does not work with, without energy. So, the essence of energy or the root of all energy is called Parashakti. So, it is usually depicted as feminine in gender. Because a mother who keeps the child in the womb is always a woman. So, the female aspect of the supreme reality worshipped as the mother goddess is what is meant by Sri Vidya. She is also called Raja Rajeshwari, Tripura Sundari and so on. Now this energy which is the counterpart of Shiva, so it is Shiva and Shakti. Now in Tantra a great deal of importance is given to Shakti, even more than that which is given to Shiva because the understanding is when everything is quiet, 
when everything is tranquil, then it is Shivam. When there is activity and movement, then it Shakti presents herself, manifests herself. Now, the whole world is pervaded by Shakti. Einstein has proved it in physics that everything is energy. That energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. Now, this energy which changes in one form into another is what is known as Parashakti. Of course, it is worshipped in the form, different forms, but this is Parashakti. Now, as far as the human individual is concerned, this energy dwells in every living being after having done the work of creating this body in the womb. At the bottom of the spine, in a triangular uh, shape, like a coiled up snake, this energy, which is Parashakti, as the individual manifestation in every human being, is known as the Kundalini. So, Kula Kundalini means actually the Shakti who remains unmanifest, hidden in the bottom of the spine of every living being. Now, Samaya Marga, Tantra as practice in Samaya Marga, is not much to do with the external worship of Shakti in the Yantras, which is called the Sri Yantra and so on which are symbolic manifestations of the inner mechanisms. But it is to do with touching the inner Shakti, which is the Kundalini, and through various practices, including devotion, allowing it or letting it or making it ascend from the bottom of the spine, chakra by chakra or center by center to the top of the head, which is the Sahasrara Chakra or the thousand petaled lotus, uh, where the presence of Shivam is acknowledged. And when the Shakti reaches there, Shiva and Shakti become one. This is the concept of Ardhanarishwara, which is where half is man and half is woman. This movement, it's not physical, it's to do with the mind. Uh, now, Samaya Marga deals with this process of purifying the nadis, Shushumna Nadi, the central channel. Now that nadi is also called Kula. So therefore, the practitioners are also called Kaulas, those who walk on this Kula, through which Kula Kundalini moves. And this practice is what is known as the Sri Vidya. Now the mantra taught in this only consists of bijaksharas. There are no words, there are only sounds. You know, bijakshara is a concept in which the ancient scientists, spiritual scientists who are known as the rishis, have discovered that each sound has a certain effect on the outside world as well as in the inner psyche and they have selected some sounds which are called bijaksharas, for example, hreem, her, uh, im, hreem. This is a sound. It has no meaning. It represents shakti, but actually it has no word meaning in the dictionary. Now, om. Now, om is called pranava because it is the root sound for all the mantras. Om actually does not mean anything. It means it's mostly a sound. Although, Symbolically, it represents creation, preservation, destruction and so on. Actually, the more importance to, is to be given to the sound of Om than to the meaning of Om. It's called Pranava because it is the beginning of the movement of Prana. Now, this, these Vijaksharas, like Hreem, etc., are uh, put together in a certain order and chanted in the mind starting from the lowest center which is called the Muladhara and which is represented by a triangle with its apex down and chanted at each center. There are six centers starting from Muladhara 
and reaching the seventh center which is the Sahasrara. Now, each of these centers a particular sound or Bijakshara mantra is used to clear and purify those centers and Shakti is led up in her wild dance from the Muladhara up the other chakras till she reaches the Sahasrara chakra and the union between Shiva and Shakti takes place there and the whole mind, body and soul of the practitioner Upasaka is in complete bliss which when one has experienced there is no craving for any of the smaller little uh, sensations that we normally crave for as human beings. This is the whole thing which is known as Sri Vidya Upasana. So this is the thing that was taught to me by Dada, this Bengali person and uh, I learnt the mantra from him and I continued to chant it till a certain point. Even now I do it sometimes in meditation because it is a very, very potent way of keeping the energies in circulation up and down one's consciousness or one's Shushumna Nadi. Now, so having stayed there for some time, we came back again to the plains and went back to Rishikesh. Before stopping, I have to mention something else. Uh, around three times I have been to Gomuk in those days. Afterwards I went again, that is a different thing with those days. And out of that two with Babaji and once alone. Babaji said, go alone. And once on the way to uh, Gomuk, while I was traveling to Gomuk, I met a, a foreigner who was living there in one of the caves and practicing uh, Kriya Yoga. Uh, I'm not supposed to mention his name. Babaji used to call him the German. He was from Germany, from Stuttgart, a uh, scientist from Stuttgart who was experimenting on, who was a neurologist from Stuttgart, who was experimenting on sound and the effect it has on the human brain. So, Babaji had told me that when you go to Gomuk this time alone, meet uh, the German and stay two days with him in the Kutir. So, I agreed. So, I went and met him. So, I asked him, how do you know Babaji? How did you know Babaji? He said he had come to the Himalayas many times because he was very uh, much interested in this uh, experiments, research on the connection between the brain and neurology and the experiences that yogis are supposed to get in deep meditation. He had, did a, he had done a great deal of study on the pineal gland and the pituitary gland and the effect of the hormones on the system and he had mapped, he was beginning to find out ways and means, I'm talking about many years ago, of how to map the moment of energies in deep meditation. About the pineal gland, which is a very, very small organ, which is shaped like a little green chili, not as big as a green chili, but shape, is somewhere in the midbrain, very close to the limbic system that we have. All this I learned from him. And it was considered for a long time to be a vestige organ which had no um, function for the human body, in the human body. Few years ago, they found out that it controls the sleeping rhythms uh, and uh, has, uh, uh, secretes a hormone which produces sleep. When actually when you go and when it is dark and you pull the curtains and switch off the light, when it becomes dark, the pineal gland releases a small amount, infinitesimally small amount of a certain hormone into the system. I forget the name of that hormone right now, which immediately produces sleep. Now they are selling tablets 
mm, which contain this hormone so that if you have a jet lag, if you have traveled for a long time, I think it is serotonin, I'm not very sure. Uh, and when you come back from long distance, you have jet lag, you can't adjust to the time. So when you're awake, normally you should be awake, you would be sleepy. And when you're normally sleeping, you would be awake. Now if you eat a serotonin tablet, then your sleeping pattern is adjusted. I'm not saying that you should, there are other ways and means of doing it because dependence on drugs is not a good idea at all for the mind. Uh, all I am trying to say is that an organ which was considered a vestige organ is now found to be a very important organ which, sir, which, which controls the sleeping pattern, the sleeping rhythm. Now, according to the neurologist, according to the German, he said it probably has other functions which he was trying to discover. He was experimenting on these. He was doing a lot of research. He was also doing a, a research on some of the older writers on neurology who believed that the human body, the human organism is uh, wired for a spiritual experience. Whether you have it or not, depending upon various factors, it already has the faculties which can, which uh, make the brain capable of experiencing what is called a spiritual state. So he was also doing a lot of research on that. Later on when I read Oliver Sacks and uh, you know the famous neurologist uh, Oliver Sacks of New York who wrote a beautiful book called A Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Uh, it's all about neurology and his different patients. And when I read that, and later on when I met uh, uh, this uh, uh, friend of mine, uh, Dr. Ramachandran, who wrote uh, Phantoms in the Brain. I, he's a professor uh, and a practicing uh, psych, uh, neurologist in San Diego. I found out what the German was trying to say with a little more clarity. Uh, he said, so I said, but how did you meet Babaji? He said, that is a very interesting story. He said, I've come several times to Gomuk. And once when I arrived at Gomuk and I was staying in a little kutir, wondering if I can find a genuine yogi somewhere who can guide me on this matter of the brain and neurology and kundalini and so on. He had a good knowledge of Hatha Yoga Pradipika, Sat Chakra Nirupana. He had also read Sir John Woodroffe's Serpent Power. So he was theoretically well equipped. He said one day he saw a tall, fair gentleman with the red, uh, almost brown hair matted and tied up on the top of the head, wearing only a white piece of cloth, he said, in those in that cold of Gomuk walking towards him. Uh, he was in a way surprised to see somebody like that, but beyond that, he said he was completely shocked when he came near him and said in German, Guten Tag, which means good morning, good day. So he also said Guten Tag, and then they sat down and Babaji said to him, uh, I can't talk much in, when my German is not so good, so can we talk in English? So he's, they talked together for a while and then he found out that this was the person or the kind of person that he was seeking who could actually through personal experience guide him towards these matters. So he, Babaji decided to spend a week with him and at the end of the week, he was also initiated into Kriya Yoga, or the practice of Kriya Yoga, by which the Shushumna Nadi is cleaned and the energy is made to rise up to the Sahasrara Chakra. So, this is the same Kriya Yoga about which Yogananda Paramahamsa writes about in the autobiography of a yogi. Uh, he was initiated into Kriya Yoga and when I met him, for the last, for the for three years, he had already been a Kriya Yoga practitioner and a Sri Vidya Upasaka. And um, Babaji had told me 
that he was quite an advanced sadhak and that I could learn quite a few things from him. So I stayed with him for some time and learned as much as I could. Then after that, we went back to, I went back to Rishikesh and met Babaji again and spent some more time wandering in Rishikesh, basing ourselves in the cave of uh, Mauni Baba, in Mauni Baba's cave. <clears throat> now, that was the, one of the most beautiful parts of my life when I was convinced that this is going to be my life forever. I was going to walk on the banks of the Ganga as free as a bird, eat what food comes, not bother about an agenda. There was no agenda actually except that I wanted to finally go to the essence of consciousness. There was no other external agenda and not even a program in the sense that Babaji's way of life was not to decide beforehand where one should go. One morning he would get up and say, ah, now we will go to Uttarkashi and we will go to Uttarkashi. Then he said, now we are returning from Uttarkashi, you return from Uttarkashi. And there was no fixed uh, blueprint. Everything was free and fresh air, free for all, for which you don't have to pay <laughs> and, and so on. And I was enjoying this life and meditating deeply and in blissfully living in this condition, thinking, that this is going to be my cup of tea forever. When Babaji woke me up from that wonderful sleep, one day by declaring that now, it was around three and a half years I was with him. He said, whatever you have to study with me for this, this particular time has already been done. And now, I said, now what, Babaji, any more advanced studies? He said, no more advanced studies. You have to go back. I said, go back? He said, yes, you have to go back to the fields, go back to your parents, live normally like anybody else, and then pursue your spiritual practices. Uh, I will guide you. When it is necessary. I said, are you saying that I'll never see you again? He said, no, 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 no. Whenever you need it or whenever I think you need to see me, I will see you.